You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is David Bruns and J.R. Olson. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories today. We've got a fantastic show lined up for you. Before we get into that, I'd like to tell you about some sponsors today. Crystal Pico Watanabe at Pico's House. The Pico's House website now has a new look. She's got a team of eight people who help provide services to fiction authors. And she has a full slate of services that now include beta reading. She's got four beta readers now. So if you're looking for beta reading services, she can definitely take on your project. Manuscript critique, developmental editing, line editing, copy editing, and proofreading. Authors can also inquire about putting their books in her Book Lovers Box, which is a monthly digital subscription box with a different theme each month. It's free to authors for a limited time. Be sure to check out Crystal and her whole team at Pico's House. That's P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E dot com. Thanks, Crystal, for sponsoring the show. While Cape and Spandex movies are breaking box office records, comic book commentator and influencer Ed Gosney doesn't want us to forget the roots of these marvelous wonders. His blog, Cool Comics in My Collection at edgosney.com, covers the gamut of four-color entertainment from contemporary comic books to comics made for kids to bargain bin gold to classics that will transport you back in time. Comic books are a perfect blend of art and story, and Cool Comics captures the essence of what these funny books mean to us in a personal way. And make sure to join the Cool Comics in My Collection Facebook group where members can interact, show off their prized comics, and have opportunities to win. You guessed it, Cool Comics. Published weekly, Cool Comics in My Collection aims to bring you a smile and reminds us why comic books are fun. Be sure to visit edgosney.com today. Speaking of superheroes and comics, my friend Patricia Gillum has a fantastic series called The Heroes of Corvus. It begins with book one. A flight between a second-generation superhero named Red Bolt and a villain for hire named Icarus goes terribly wrong, resulting in the drowning deaths of three innocent civilians and orphaning a six-year-old boy. Racked with guilt, Red Bolt visits Cameron Wilson at the hospital every night and won't leave the boy's side until he falls asleep. Befriended by a night shift nurse, the man in costume begins to disclose what really happened after the fight and why he feels the deaths of Cameron's parents and sister fall on his actions. A superhero didn't survive that night, and Cameron and the rest of the city aren't out of danger. This is such a phenomenal story. Uh, She has released up to part four now, and I cannot wait for part five to come out. If you're looking for a great adventure read that's uh, on the cutting edge of what is in today's entertainment, The Heroes of Corvus is the series for you by Patricia Gillum. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to go to HankGarner.com to subscribe to the show. We're on just about every platform you can imagine. Now stay tuned for our show. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have my friends David Bruns and J.R. Olson back on the show with me. This is the uh, the third time that the two Navy guys have been on the show with me. Uh, they had two previous novels that they wrote together, and this is the third uh this one is with a uh, a major publisher, uh, a top five publisher. That uh, so this project's a little different, and I think we're going to get into all of that. But one thing you can rest assured, this is pulse pounding uh, thriller. Like like you uh, this this book, I'm, I'm going to talk more about it in a minute. But this has been one of the most fun books that I've gotten to read uh, this year for lots of great uh, reasons. The book is called Rules of Engagement, and uh, welcome back to the show, David and JR. Thanks for having us on. Yeah. Thanks so much. It's good to talk to you again, Hank. So so this is book three. David, where does this book find us in the beginning? So uh, actually, uh, speaking of pulse pounding, uh, the opening scene is actually a cyber hack on a uh, U.S. power plant. 
and it takes the power plant down and takes out basically the East Coast. So, so there's no spoilers because this happens in like the first right. three pages. <laughs> right. um, uh, but it, but it all, it's, it, it's, it's there for a couple of reasons. It's there to sort of highlight what this kind of threat can do. I mean, as you know from having us back previously, we take uh, threats that we read about in the paper or threats that we know about or current threats, and we extrapolate. We take the dial and we turn it up to 11. Um, so uh, cyber warfare, when we started working on this book in 2016, um, it was not as much of the national conversation as it is now, which is a good thing, uh, we think. Right. Um, and uh, so we were really working with things that were just store, sort of coming into the news, that, things like the Office of Personnel Management hack. Um, the, I think the movie Zero Days from, uh, from the, uh, the alleged hack of the uh, Natan's uh, um, centrifuges in uh, Iran. Uh, had not quite hit the news yet. Um, so these were things that, that were sort of floating around in the ether. But as we we're writing the book, a lot of these things were were coming out. JR, um, I know that, that you guys have very specific roles uh, in the crafting of these books. That um, uh, And you, from our conversations of the past, you tend to be the guy that does all the deep research and, and really comes up with the the depth of knowledge that we uh, get from these books. Uh, when you guys are starting to plan out a new scenario, um, how do you decide where to start researching and what things are going to be pertinent to this story? Uh, b- because, you know, you could do like uh, you know, Tom Clancy and turn in a 900-page book, and we, <laughs> and we come in with, with more details than we ever, ever need. Um, but, you know, Clancy had a way of doing that and keeping us entertained. Um, but there's mm. a there's a there's an art to telling us enough to to make us feel informed and to make us as the readers feel like we're knowledgeable um, without us having to know the minutia. So uh, how do you begin to do that, uh, Jr. And how do you decide what things we need to know? <clears throat> well, I think it I think it really starts with the premise that you know David and I try to tackle. Uh, the threats of our modern era, right? And and the books tend to reflect that. Uh, so I think kind of the best way to frame it is, you know, we look for an issue, a, a significant issue that's uh, a modern day challenge, a modern day threat. And uh, we kick that, that idea around quite a bit. And then I'll sit down and sort of come up with a concept of a story arc. We talk about it more. Uh, you know, David gives me some great feedback and then I kind of go to work and kind of lay out a little bit more detailed story arc and, and whatnot. And we just kind of go back and forth until we sort of settle on, uh, what the story is really going to look like. And then I sit down and, uh, try and plot out sort of a, you know, a generalized chapter by chapter outline so that we can see what that story arc looks like. Uh, and David gives me lots of feedback as we go through that because, you know, he's the, he's going to be the one that takes the first cut at the actual story. Uh, so he needs to understand exactly what's happening, you know, on the part of each character and how their interplay uh, is impacted throughout the whole storyline. Uh, so we we sort of just try to weave in, you know, the things that are happening today in our world from a national security perspective into the storylines. And, and I I think rules of engagement has kind of done that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, from the from the cover, and I know we're told to never judge a book by its cover, but that is <laughs> that is utter bull. Um, we all judge books by their cover, and um, you know, from the very beginning, this book has that old school Tom Clancy feel, right? Um, and it it just it you know it it resonates uh, just immediately. Um, from the the submarine, uh, you know, on the front, David. I know that you were a submariner or submariner. Um, how do you how do you guys pronounce that? Uh, or, I've heard it. I've heard it both ways. So I will accept either either pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the decision to uh, to go this route? And do you feel, uh, you know, when you get to write a story like this, do you, uh, you know, kind of get those tingles like, oh, okay, this is this is my uh this is my my scene oh yeah definitely so so um we actually our first book weapons of mass deception did not have a submarine in it right and i got to the end of the book and i'm like what was i thinking <laughs> this, this, this what 
I wrote my my entire first military thriller ever, and it doesn't have a submarine in it. And I mean, you know, Tom Clancy is uh, one of my, uh, you know, the 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 hunt for Red October is one of the reasons why I went into the submarine force, uh-huh. and I actually met Tom Clancy before he before he became really famous. And um, so I, I and and it just it just never occurred to me during during that that first story so when we got to the second book i said look i th- this is about homegrown radicalism we are having a submarine in this story <laughs> and we are going to have a submarine in every subsequent story too because it just has to happen well, um, well I, I don't mean to criticize but uh you know when a when an insurance agent beats you to the submarines <laughs> was... <laughs> exactly exactly so so um when i met him i was a plebe at the academy which is uh which is navy speak for freshmen and the, actually, the only reason why I went was because uh, we got extra credit for from our freshman English class. And uh, this was before. So Hunt for Red October had just been published by Naval Institute Press. This is in like October of, uh, of 1984. And um, I went into the academy in July of 84. So I had been there a couple of months and I went to get extra credit. Not because I needed extra credit because you never pass extra credit up. And, you know, so so there's a bunch of us sitting there and this guy comes in and he looked like an insurance salesman. He's kind of schlumpy and he didn't really have at that point too much of a command presence. And, uh, you know, we sort of, hey, I wrote this book and, uh, you know, it's about submarines, but I never served on a submarine. And we're thinking, what the heck is going on here? But after you read the book, you're like, wow. And that that summer, so nine months or eight months later, I went on an actual operational submarine. And they were passing the book around the crew, and the crew was like, "I can't read this; it's too much like being on watch." So he nailed it. Wow. Um, but yeah, so so that so that kind of feeling from a thriller is what I, is what we're after, right? Is right. is the feeling that that you know you you, you could have been there, right? Right. Uh, this is the third book that you guys have done uh, together in this vein. Uh, it's not necessarily a continuing series. Um, JR, how, how do you guys determine um, where the story begins uh, w- with each? Uh, I know there's a scenario that you're going to capitalize on, but, but where do the characters come in? So that, that, so that we, we were, this is a this is a little bit more of a complicated response to the because if you want to get the, <laughs> that's, the clarity that's good. on it, that's um, good. Um, I am kind of a well, David is too, but he's he's very creative in his writing skills. I tend to be a little bit more uh, of a stickler on technical accuracy and all that kind of thing. I, maybe that comes from twenty five years uh, service to the Navy, but nah. it, it's a. <laughs> It's one of those things where when we started with the first two books, we put down specific dates and years and whatnot and specific locations, uh, thinking that that would be a way to sort of weave, you know, what's happening in the world uh, a little bit more right into the uh, the reader's mind. And when we got to the third book, we realized that we were sort of locking ourselves into specific time frames. Right. And uh, we wanted to be a little bit more open about um when the story could have taken place so rules of engagement is formatted a little bit differently than weapons of mass deception and uh jihadi apprentice in that we don't give you specific dates right and so this story could take place kind of anytime here and now you know you just you know, whenever you pick this up to read it it could be taking place you know as you read it kind of a thing and I think we're probably going to use that same format going forward from any other books that we write from here on out. Does That's, that answer your question? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, the The best thrillers are ones that make us really nervous because the story is completely <laughs> plausible. Uh, it, it it might not be, you know, um, uh, it, it might not happen tomorrow, but it makes us just nervous enough to look at the world around us and realize what a precarious position we are in most of the time. Um, the you know you take a, uh, a a situation that's completely plausible that could happen tomorrow, and then unravel that and and then kind of zoom out to the worldwide stage, 
and let us see what the implications of that are. Um, how nervous should we be about the scenario that you guys have uh, concocted? <laughs> yeah, David, so I'll let you um, answer that one. <laughs> yeah, the, the more the more we learned about cyber warfare and about the the cyber um, world, uh, the actual the more nervous you get. And part of the reason is this: is is we live very digital world. I mean, my my kids are are in their twenties and. Uh, I doubt if they've ever used a paper map go, going somewhere. Um, so you just plug it into your phone or your GPS or whatever, and you go. Just as an just as an everyday example. Um, and uh, the other thing about cyber warfare is it's is it's asymmetric, meaning that you don't have to have a tremendous amount of resources, like a billion dollars to build a bomber or a submarine. You can do it on a relatively small budget. So very small countries like a North Korea, like an Iran, like a Russia, for, for that matter, um, uh, can be on relatively equal footing. And from the perspective of, of defending us, there's a lot of attack surface in the U.S. We're a very digital economy, um, and we like it that way. Our financial institutions, our utilities, uh, uh, our personal lives, I mean, everything is on your phone, right? Everything is in the cloud, and nobody knows where the cloud actually is. Um, so, so there's a ton of attack surface for us, whereas, whereas countries like China and Russia and North Korea, especially, are locking down a lot of their uh, a lot of their uh, digital lives and, and and their and their digital surfaces. Whereas, you know, the West wants and tends to be, and we believe, rightly so, that it should be open. Um, but uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of room that uh, that has to be defended when you're doing that as well. Um, so as much as as good as we can give, um, you know, we need to be able to expect to get. Uh, so, so when you hear about hacks where uh, NSA tools were were released, we should be very worried about that. Um, and one of the things that's been really interesting in the genesis of this book is that when we started talking about it in 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 2016 versus the conversation today um it's much more in the public consciousness uh partly because yeah. of the of the 2016 election but i don't think that we have necessarily grappled with as as a country what it means and 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 what the possible ramifications are um if something were to were to really happen if we have the ability like with the nitro zeus um attack or uh uh, planning that uh, went into Iran, which was basically a plan to take the country dark if we ever ha had to invade it, they can do the same thing to us and and possibly even easier than we're able to do it to them um, because there's a lot of a lot of access points here in the u s that that a hacker can get into so i'll, I'll add I'll add two things to david's comment and, okay. and the first is uh, you, you've probably been paying attention to what's been happening in the world with regard to Huawei and uh, uh, 5G, right, which is coming. Uh, there are some obvious uh, interests there from a national security perspective, but also from a global economic perspective on, on the threats that a 5G uh, networked, uh, you know, digital world that we live in. Uh, having backdoors that uh, intelligence or, or security services or, or militaries from other countries can get into uh, whenever they want, right? Uh, we are moving towards this internet of everything where literally every electronic device or, you know, your microwave, you know, it could be connected to the internet, right? Right. And, and, and the internet of everything is made possible by something on the scale of 5G. So we are going to become completely and totally connected way more than we are today, and there are inherent dangers in that. And, and one of the interesting things that, that has happened as a result of the Russian interference in the 2016 election is an awareness by not only Americans, but I think people all around the world uh, uh, of the impact that you know, cyber has in their lives. I mean, more and more each day. But like U.S. laws have not kept up in any way, shape, or form with the advancing <laughs> technology. Uh, so you have these, you know, a, a significant, significant number of relatively elderly statesmen sitting up there in Congress who are responsible for crafting these laws, and they have no understanding of how all this works. The best people today 
to understand the digital world in which we live and the threats that exist are, are people, you know, David's kids' ages and, and, and much younger because they are digital natives. They've grown up in this world where they're connected to everything. And those of us who are a little bit older, we're going to be struggling to figure out how, how, how to figure out where is our place in this digital world, right? Well, I remember it's probably 10 years or so ago, there was a congressman from Alaska, I believe, and I can't remember his name, but, you know, he was, he kind of became famous for talking about the internet as a series of tubes. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's yeah. like, it's like a lot of these guys understanding is, uh, is, you know, mid, you know, 1940s or so. And, uh, the technology <laughs> has not progressed for them. And, and, you know, 5G is a really interesting thing because, um, you know, I, I had a conversation with Corey Doctorow, a science fiction writer, and you know, he tends to kind of take things to, um, to a, uh, an extreme end, uh, more so than, than I tend to do. But, um, you know, he starts thinking about these things and what happens when we are connected to the extreme where people's cochlear implants are connected, you know, via 5G. And then, you know, if a hostile, you know, takeover comes in, then, then, you know, if you're able to disable things that we take for granted on a daily basis, that is, um, that's a serious, serious threat. And, uh, you know, and now we're, we're in a technology race with other countries and, uh, we may be willing to implement technologies without really, um, thinking about the implications of that, uh, just so that we can be first. And, sure. um, that's scary, scary stuff. Well, yeah, I think uh, the pace, other thing... pacemakers, right? Pacemakers yeah, right. should all be connected. Uh, right. Autonomous vehicles, I guarantee you, will be all connected, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Scary stuff. Um, one thing that I love about the stories that you guys tell is that, and, and part of this is because of the world that we live in now, you know, when, when Clancy was writing the, the Hunt for Red October, um, there were very clear battle lines, uh, for, right. for lack of a better term, drawn, where we knew who, you know, in our eyes, the good guys were and who the bad guys were. Right. We don't live in that world anymore. We, nope. things are very <laughs> gray and shaded. And, and I love that you guys take that, um, take that to task in your books. And the, we have antagonists and protagonists that, um, uh, that we don't suspect to to do things, um, and and it's very reflective, I think, of of the the battle um, that that we're in these days. Uh, is that something that you guys think through a lot in the writing? And do you do you choose these characters in a way to to highlight that and to keep us guessing? Yeah, I mean, we we definitely enjoy the complexity of the characters, but it's also reflective of of the age we live in, like you've so rightly pointed out. I mean, when we were coming up in the Navy and I was on a submarine and JR was a Naval Intel officer, I mean, you know, the threat was the Soviets, period, end of story. We didn't talk about anybody else, or at least the submarine force didn't. So, I mean, all of our tactics, every, literally everything we did was about the Soviets. So when the Soviet Union collapsed in, uh, in late 91, it was, it was, it was cataclysmic, um, and the interesting thing is um, I was on board a submarine that was involved in a collision with a Russian submarine, and as we're going through you know, promotions for this, one of the things that the, that the um, uh, publisher wanted us to do was write a couple of blog posts, and I volunteered to write a blog post on that. So th this was unusual in that it was right around the time that the Soviet Union was collapsing, and uh, the U.S. government released the name of the submarine, which is something that they had never done before. So it was on CNN, and this was so. So this was before the uh, the the rise of the 24-hour news cycle. CNN was basically the only game in town, and they, although they had 24-hour programming during the wee hours, it was sort of you know infomercial stuff. Fox News didn't start until '96, and this happened in early '92. Um, so it was still a fairly localized thing. Um, but uh, I, I went back and researched what was published about it publicly at the time. And there was a really interesting USA Today article that had uh, a quote, back-to-back -back quotes from Dick Cheney, who at the time was Secretary of Defense, and Tom Clancy, who was a thriller writer. <laughs> and basically, they were <laughs> giddy almost about 
uh, what had happened about, you know, the Soviets fell, we won, and we're going to take our submarines wherever we want to go kind, kind of thing. It was really a remarkable look back. Um, but, uh, but, and you think now, oh, how naive. Well, right, exactly. And so, so now, I mean, everybody and the, the other thing is sort of comes out as, as you do the research on this is we tend to see conflict is very black and white, you know, so-and-so invades so-and-so, or there's a shooting war between this cyber warfare is a constant low level with spikes of activity. Uh, but it's but it's constant. It's daily. U.S. Cyber Command is dealing with this stuff every single day, every single minute of every single day. They're shutting stuff down. They're going on offense occasionally. Um, and so this so so the thing that that we really didn't anticipate going in was a how pervasive it is, but b how constant and how low level it is. So if you think of cyber as the fifth domain after land, sea, air, space, as as a warfare domain. Um, this one is not clear cut. It is it is it is all around us and it's happening all the time. Uh, and partly because no one's going to take on the U.S. military in a face to face battle. It's suicide. So what do you do? You weaken your opponent in other ways and you attack them around the edges. Uh, so this is what China's doing, both uh, from an industrial espionage standpoint. And this is what Russia is doing with their with with Ukraine and with Crimea and, you know, the whole advent of of the little green men. All that started with a massive cyber hack um, before the invasion started. Well, over the last 20 years, when, when we think of terrorism, we think of um, you know, one of the first images that comes to mind are these. Uh, people that blend in with society and uh, and you know bomb um, you know jihadi apprentice was was a great picture of that in a lot of ways. Um, it, when we start thinking about the the cyber domain and the kinds of terrorism that come with that, um, it, the the scope and the playing field get really wide mm. um, when you start thinking through the implications. And in the book, you take it very wide, and and we start looking at. Uh, you know the possibilities of World War Three with with big um, uh, players on on the map. Mm. Um, what was the uh, what was the process like of, of trying to figure out who was going to be involved and what the uh, how these implications would affect other major players and start kind of running those scenarios? So you you we've talked already about weapons of mass uh, deception and jihadi apprentice and and uh, you mentioned a little while ago about you know kind of the development of our characters uh david has used the phrase you know we're, we're sympathetic to our antagonists which is kind of a unique uh, situation to be in you know you read about our core antagonist and you get to know him over the first two books uh he has a uh, a role to play in this third book as well and uh if you if you sort of understand that he, he's kind of breaking down mentally uh, and, and is sort of enraged at this point uh, after everything that's happened to him in his life, you start to recognize that anything could potentially happen if all he wants to, to see is the world burn, right? Right. So uh, we, we kicked that idea around. We tried to figure out, well, how do we make that happen? And uh, the scenario that we came up with, uh, I think, sort of effectively brings that to bear. Uh, where our our primary you know antagonist there has an opportunity to do some uh, some damage and, and succeeds and succeeds and, and that's part of what David was talking about before right I mean nobody wants to take on the U.S. military directly but and there's an old saying that says um, the only way to fight the U.S. military is asymmetrically or stupidly so asymmetrically is the way to do it and uh, in this book I think I think we made that happen in many regards. Um, I guess that that's probably David. Do you want anything anything to add on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the thing that uh, that uh, when we think about the 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 smaller scenarios, the uh, power plan hack, and, and and there's some other things. In almost all cases, we leveraged off of an existing thing that had happened, whether it was the Office of Personnel Management hack, partly because there's some good reporting out there on what actually happened and sort of how these things how these hacks happen. Now, I mean, both of us in our past have had security clearances. They're, they're not active now. And we don't use classified information when we write our books. So, so we use, you know, publicly available 
uh, source source documents. Um, but when you get to the big the big battle scenes at the end, I mean, obviously we're we're sort of going off the reservation there, right? So we take you know what is the situation we can create, and how do we take that situation to eleven? Now, now World War Three sort of defines that, right? Um, <laughs> but but when you think about things going autonomous, uh, there was just an article in uh, Fortune magazine last month about the first autonomous uh, ship. So this this the ship it's uh, called the Sea Hunter doesn't even have a place on board for people to be. I mean, it's not like it's not like an autonomous car now where you know, somebody sits behind the wheel, but the car does the driving. There's not even any people on this thing. And it made an unassisted trip to from San Diego to Pearl Harbor and back. So something like 4,000 miles on its own. Now, there was actually one uh, mechanical assist en route. But apart from that, so when you think about that kind of, this is, this is different than a drone today, which is, which is uh, being operated by an operator out of Creech Air Force Base and flying over, you know, uh, whatever in, in Africa or in uh, the Middle East. Uh, this is a completely autonomous um, uh, ship. And when you start to think, when you start to extrapolate from things like that, boy, it, it just, I mean, it rapidly goes to science fiction. <laughs> right. Um JR mentioned uh, the uh, you know being sympathetic to your antagonist. Um, you know one of the one of the things that you hear uh, writers talk about from time to time is the the idea that your antagonist should believe that he's the hero of his own story, yeah. Yeah. and and that makes <laughs> for really compelling you know fiction. Uh, and you know if you can uh, you know give good things to your antagonist more than your protagonist, uh, that's a good story. If you can torture your antagonist as much as your protagonist, that's a great story. Mm. Um, are there, uh, when you start thinking about the antagonist, how do you get inside his head to start uh, making his story believable uh, that we really, not that we're rooting for him, <laughs> but we start to understand yeah. his motivations? Well, yeah, I, th I think you actually said it. I mean, everyone thinks that they're the hero of of their own story. Uh, so whether you're whether you're the good guy or whether you're the bad guy, bad guys are motivated by things too, um, and and you just need to figure out what those motivations are. Now, what they actually end up doing um, might be heroic in their own mind, but they're not necessarily heroic in the larger societal context. Um, and actually, it's interesting you should mention that because one of the things that the editor told us uh, at St. Martin's when they bought the book was one of the reasons why they wanted it was because of the antagonist, because of the villain. Um, and, and and they liked him so much. And keep in mind, this is this is actually the third book. So this we the that that particular villain was introduced in our first book, Weapons of Mass Deception. He was a major player in the second book and then is is the major player in the third book. So he didn't have the benefit of the first two books and he still loved it. So that, that was very gratifying for us to hear. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think you have to create your antagonist in a way where you fully understand that for the antagonist or antagonists, the decisions they make, the motivations they have, those are rational decisions that they make. And you have to sort of explore that and make sure that in, in the writing, you come to that conclusion, right? I mean, it has to be pretty clear why the antagonist is doing what he or she is doing. Well, then it, it makes it more scary uh, when you right. know that someone is doing something from a personal passion and, and a personal sense of righteousness. Mm -hmm. uh, right. That is, yep. that is extra scary. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the book rules of engagement uh, came out yesterday. Uh, when you guys are hearing this, uh, you mentioned it, David, uh, the St. Martin's Press had picked up the book. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that process. The first two books um, were were self published by you guys, uh, and the you know you guys really blazed some new territory with the first book and and doing the crowdsourcing and and you guys produced these beautiful hardcover books, which is just nearly unheard of in the indie space, um, and you know just really did some new and unique things to to launch that book. Um, what brought you to to wanting to traditionally publish this book and 
and how has that experience been for you? <laughs> so I'll give you the inside story. So okay. we were writing, uh, we were writing uh, rules of engagement, which at the time was called war.exe, which was named <laughs> by my, by my 19 year old software engineer son. Um, I love that. And, uh, and which we thought was a great title, by the way, um, it, it, it fell by the wayside for a whole bunch of reasons, but, uh, we were writing that. So it was like November, December of 2016. And, uh, JR came to me and said, you know, I, I, I think we should try to get an agent and try to sell this to a, to a major publisher. And I was like, yeah, I, I don't really want to do that. I mean, I, I was firmly indie. Um, and happy to be so. Um, but, uh, you know, in a moment of weakness, I said, well, there, there's a, there, there's an organization <laughs> here in uh, Minneapolis called the literary loft and I'm a member of it. And every spring, the first week of April, they run a, um, uh, uh, pitch conference where they, you know, talk about pitches and they bring in agents and you pay your however many hundred dollars and you get 10 minutes with three agents. So because I was a member of that organization, you get advanced sign up. And it just so happened that that day came in, landed in my email box, an opportunity to do a pre sign up. So you'd be guaranteed space at an early bird rate and all that kind of stuff. So JR comes to me a second time and I'm like, okay, tell you what, I'll sign up for this, for this uh, pitch conference and I'll go. And if anything happens, then, you know, we can, we can pursue it. If not, then we'll drop it. He says, that sounds great. So we, so this is November and I sign up and we finish the book and we send it to our editor and she edits it and we get it back and we make changes. So, you know, as, as April is drawing closer, I'm like, what the heck did I do this for? Because getting a pitch together is actually quite, it, it takes a lot of brain power. It takes a lot of thought about, you know, narrowing down and, 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 and winnowing down the essence of your book that you can explain to somebody in a couple of sentences, literally a couple of sentences. Um, and so, sometimes that's harder than the actual writing. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a completely different skill set. is actually what it is, right? It's, it's like the difference between writing a novel and writing a blur, right? The, um, you know, they're, they're, they're both necessary and they're both, you know, artistic and creative in their own way, but they're completely different muscles. Um, anyway, went to the, uh, pitch conference, pitched to three agents. We had three agents who wanted to see either the full manuscript or samples at the same time. We had a friend of ours who also who wrote submarine thrillers and was with St. Martin's and introduced us to Hidge Agent. Long story short, over the course of the next month or so, we signed with an agent, and I was about to go to Clarion West for the summer, so this was in 2017. And so we gave it to our agent, who's John Talbot, and said, you know, look, you you uh, have the summer to see if you can find a home for this thing. And so the other thing about it, we were very clear with him in terms of, you know, we had crowdfunded and self-published books. So we knew how much we, we made on that. And so we didn't really, we weren't really interested in a small press that was going to give us a relatively small advance because why would we do that? Right. Um, so we said, we're interested in a major publisher. And he says, I totally understand. He's a great agent. Um, and over the course of the next couple of months, he submitted it to, I don't know, I think 13 or 14 or 15 editors. And we got back a, a series of no's. Uh, probably half a dozen or so. Um, and actually, it, interestingly, the most common reason why editors at these places said no was they said the book's too timely. Um, <laughs> because, you know, we're at, at, at this point, you, you're having stuff in the news like fire and fury, right? Um, and they're like, we don't even know if we're going to have a North Korea in, in two years. So why would I want to buy a book about North Korea? Um, so uh, uh, John uh, landed us an offer from St. Martin's Press for, for a two-book deal. Um, it, it, the, the process is – it takes a long time. I mean, from verbal offer to signed contract was probably, what, JR, three months, four months? Yeah, probably four or five months. Yeah, it was from, like, uh, verbal offer at the end of September to signed contract beginning of January. Um, so it was – I mean, it, it's, it's a it's, – it ain't instant noodles, man. No. Right. Well, well, yeah. I mean, we we are getting uh, uh, books in now from from publicists at the at the big five. We're getting in December books now to yeah. start looking at for right. scheduling interviews on the show, and it's a it's a different uh, yeah. it's a different machinery for sure. Well, they're buying for a catalog, right? So, right. you know, in 2017, they were buying for their 2019 catalog. 
Um, and you know, we are, uh, we, we've been very happy with them, but we are one of many authors that they have and, and they're very sure. clear about that. And that's fine with us. I mean, you know, every time all of our interactions with them have been very professional and we've been very happy with them. Uh, but it's not like, you know, you know, hit, you know, hit publish and, you know, sit back and, 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 uh, you know, look at your sales, go on the Amazon dashboard. It's, it, it ain't like that at all. No, no. <laughs> I think the thing that shocked me, you know, because David and I had gone through the process with uh, crowdfunding the first two books. So we were in total control of the whole pace of everything. And when we were ready, we were able to launch that book immediately. Yeah. Uh, and the process here, when you go with a major publishing house, it, it's about 18 months from the time, you know, you submit that finished manuscript uh, to the editorial team before your book actually hits the street. And, and for them, it's an assembly line process. It's a well-oiled machine. They know exactly what you're doing. But if you're in that creative space as, as the writing or the writer or the writing team, and you've done it before and you know how quickly you can get it out, it's, yeah. it's sort of a, a mental shock to realize <laughs> that you're gonna have to sit back and wait for a year and a half yeah. before your book finally hits the street. <laughs> well, what is the what's the interaction like with the publisher during that eighteen month period? When when you've turned the book in, and now okay, a year and a half from now the book's going to be out. What is going on in that intervening time between you and the publisher? Yeah, so That's a great uh, question. Yeah, I mean, there's so, so uh, basically the process is you turn the manuscript in, you get notes back from the editor, and the notes. So the the notes for rules of engagement were actually relatively minor. I mean, I think we probably. And, and was basically um, it, pulling some some of the characters into the fore. There was one major plot thing, um, which has to do with the ending that uh, we changed for series reasons. Um, uh, one of the major characters was taken off the board, and, and it was a different character than is actually taken off the board in the book that you have. Um, we can probably talk about that offline, Hank. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, uh, you know, so so the 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 rewrite process on rules of engagement was actually very very minor. I mean, it took us I don't know a few weeks or a month or something like that. Yeah. And, and uh, so I mean, p part of it is when you when you have a manuscript sitting for that long and you get notes on it, you have to go back and read the manuscript because I mean, it's not like I remember what happened in chapter thirty when I wrote it six months ago. Um, so the first thing you have to do is reread the whole book, then read his notes in context. Uh, once it once it's accepted, uh, it goes to a copy editing phase, um, and the copy editor is forensic. She's well, we think it's a she. It's it's initials on a Microsoft Word document. The person was extremely forensic, uh, very good. We ended up changing a few things based on some research that they did. And our research yeah. up front was actually pretty good. So uh, that that's like like for example, some of the names of bases and things. You know, we we would get this note that says, "I looked this up, and this is the official name that I found." Are you referencing a different place? And so we would go and look it up, and we're like, "Hmm, I think maybe they're right." Yeah. Uh, so. Um, and then it goes to I think they call it first pages, which is basically a loose leaf version of the hardback book uh, that you go through and look at all the formatting and things. And after that, it's basically out of our hands. So that, that finished, I think we gave them first pages feedback last September. Right There it goes to an arc, a, a bound arc, which goes to Kirkus and Publishers Weekly and, uh, you know, other authors who are going to give uh, pull quotes and, and things like that. Uh, it goes into the St. Martin's catalog in the spring, in March, and it goes on sale in the summer. Uh, so the catalog is used for their sales force to sell to bookstores and things. So, so there's a continuing process uh, that oh, yeah. the book is, is, is going through. At, at what point do you start talking about the next book? So Why we have to deal. And, uh, <laughs> we, so we, had, we turned in the next book uh, in January of this year. Okay. For publish in uh, June of 2020. Um, so you know, part of that is at the whim of the editor when he gets feedback to us. Um, but so the so the fourth book is actually written, um, gotcha. and uh, we're actually talking about the fifth book, whether or not there's a contract on it or not. 
so when the wheels start turning um, and, and you start getting past that first book, um, it it gets to be a little uh, a little more predictable. It's that it's that first book that that everything's askew. Uh, but once the machinery gets going, it's a it's kind of a continuing process. Yeah, I mean, it's so so once you're sort of in the catalog and 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 in the process, yeah, I mean, you've you've got a book working basically, you know, the whole time in some stage. I think, yeah, yeah, right. Gotcha. Well, um, since you guys have turned in book number four, can you give us a tease of <laughs> of what we can look forward to? So I'll, I'll take that one, David. Okay. okay. So, so we mentioned earlier in this discussion that we, we try to take a look at the, the threats of our modern times, right? And uh, we craft these stories to sort of uh, address those issues. And if you think of uh, the fact that weapons of mass deception was about uh, nuclear proliferation from non-state actors, uh, Jihadi Apprentice was about, uh, you know, recruitment, uh, manipulation, recruitment, and motivating uh, people to carry out uh, acts of terrorism. Uh, rules of engagement sort of takes uh, cyber into account uh, in this digital world in which we live. So you have some of these significant threats that are out there. And, and from my perspective as a career naval intelligence officer, the one thing that always used to freak me right the heck out was the idea of somebody succeeding in weaponizing some sort of biological threat and succeeding in getting that, you know, launched uh, against a target. Uh, because once that genie is out of the bottle, it's pretty hard to put it back in, right? I mean, uh, biology is a, is a tricky thing. Uh, kind of like cyber. David mentioned that earlier. You know, when you use a cyber weapon, quote unquote, uh, it, it is now out there in the domain for anybody to capture and reverse engineer, which is one of the reasons why the Stuxnet effort was uh, could, could be a bit problematic. And the release of the NSA uh, tools through that hack recently could, could come back to bite everybody in, in, in the tail. But this new story has a, has a bit of the bio threat flavor to it. And that's probably all we should say for now. <laughs> well, thanks a lot for feeding into my neuroses. And, <laughs> yeah, no uh, problem. Uh, no problem. Uh, I need to go wash my hands now. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, the new book, Rules of Engagement, is out now. You can get it in your hot little hands today. When you're hearing this, it is book number three from David Bruns and J.R. Olson. Uh, guys, I absolutely love what you're doing. I love the new book and uh, we're going to send everybody to see you and to, uh, and to pick up their copy uh, of rules of engagement. Is there a place online where they can uh, connect with you guys and follow up with all that you're doing? Yes, they can. You can go to my website. It's David Bruns. That's spelled B R U N S uh, not Burns. It's Bruns. Um, and if you go to davidbruns.com, uh, you can find all the buy links and background on rules of engagement as well as our prior novels. Uh, and there is one uh, earlier, uh, shorter novella there uh, as a reader magnet if you're interested in joining our readers group. And if people are just discovering your series through this new book, uh, we want to reiterate that there are two books previous to this one, and we'll put links to those and links to the previous uh, visits to the show in there so people can get the full experience as well. Perfect. Excellent. Thanks, guys, for uh, joining me again. We're going to send everybody to see you, and uh, congrats on uh, book launch day. Thanks okay. so much, Hank. Thanks for listening to this episode of Author Stories. Go to hankgarner.com to find all of the archives of the show, and be sure to subscribe while you're there. Now stay tuned for a special audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. The ancient building wore the severe cassock colors of a Puritan minister, a uniform monochrome of slate-gray shingles and soot-gray clabberds. Its shadowed upper windows cross-hatched like the facets of a spider's eye. The second story protruded beyond the first and bore the house's only ornament, two gray teardrops of wood, weeping from each corner of the building's stiff upper lip. The place would have looked sinister and foreboding in its shadowed alley if not for the die-cut silhouette of a dancing sheep, jaunty above the door, and the two front bay windows that blazed with colorful, welcoming light. The windows were hung with orbs of colored glass on staggered lengths of ribbon. Each orb glowed with autumnal reds and delicate greens, burgundy tints and pumpkin hues, dappled raspberry and clover lime, 
streaked with light and weightless as bubbles over a cauldron. The shelves below offered crystal skulls and silver daggers and horny devils, Celtic chalices and woven dream catchers in dreamcoat hues. A primitive broom leaned in a corner, ready for flight, and a rhapsodic nude in bronze clutched her goat-legged lover beneath a jackal bust of Anubis. The interior of the shop was even witchier. Above a crude and sooty fireplace, a stack of brick barely holding the shape of a chimney pushed through the barn-high roof, threading ancient beams that crisscrossed overhead. Brooms and kettles and Christmas lights dangled from these, alongside Halloween costumes and Chinese umbrellas, pointy hats and bundles of herbs. Jason wandered deeper into the shop. His fingers trailed across strange bronze statuary and Aztec masks of turquoise and lapis lazuli. He rolled his eyes at the luck candles and money charms, but goggled indecently at a nude and anatomically correct silver nymph with long golden hair that reminded him of Kate. See anything you like? Jason jumped, turned, and jumped again. The woman standing before him was the living embodiment of every hippy-dippy counterculture type he'd ever seen. Her hair was green, her face pale and round, her doughy body wrapped in some elaborately woven ethnic garb. Her eyebrows were black and pierced in little rows, and her eyes were heavily circled with midnight blue, as if she'd been sucker-punched by an oil slick. She tapped the glass over the nymph. Admiring the goddess, I see. Oh, uh, uh, she practically caught him with porn. You want to hold her? She won't break. Here. The woman flipped open a glass door and handed Jason the naked figure. See how heavy she is? You could bang her against the wall all day and barely make a dent. She waggled her eyebrows, obviously enjoying his discomfort. He checked the price tag. Seven hundred bucks? The goddess is a symbol of love and fertility. Don't be ashamed of desiring her. The woman's long green fingernails plucked a long black cigarette from a long red case, and she lit it. I sense... She blew smoke and studied its whirls. Dissatisfaction in love? Yes, I have just the thing. She pulled Jason into a side room, where the smell of her clove smoke gave way to the skunky aromas of potpourri sachets, tea leaves, and hanging clutches of twiggy flowers. She searched, found a little bundle, and pressed it into his hand. This will make you irresistible. Rub it on your nethers twice a day, and love shall surely find you. Jason made a face. The bundle smelled like cow manure. He didn't even want that on his hands.